thank you, Honorable, for the very enlightening and humorous talk. Uh, my question is that, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I remember Ajahn Chah once said that if you try to understand anatta, non-self, your mind will just explode. And then here you are trying to explain what anatta <laughs> is. So, so can you reconcile what he said versus what you're trying to do to us? My mind has not exploded yet, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think the, what he was pointing at was, you know, if you only think about it, you, know, it, you, you can't get your head around it because the thinking is part of yourself. So there, there's yourself thinking about yourself. or think, Here's yourself thinking about your not-self. So it just, it's so, so confusing. It's, it's like, a, it's a paradox, you see. Yourself thinking about your not-self. But when you, when you practice the Buddhist teachings through meditation, for example, and practice of generosity, you're actually living that example, not your, or in meditation you're reflecting upon it, not just thinking about it. You're trying to observe the nature. I mean, a very simple exercise would be, you know, just inquire, investigate, what do you take to be yourself, precisely? We all say, oh, me, 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 me. What exactly is me? Yeah. Physically? Mentally? Are you the body? Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> I mean, when I'm 25, I can say that I'm on the body, you know. But now that I'm 69, I don't want this body. <laughs> When I'm in a when I'm in a, in a happy mood, I say, "Oh yes, I'm I'm happy feeling." But when the feeling becomes unpleasant, no, no that's not me. <laughs> memory, memory tends, seems to persist to some degree, but now after all these years, I'm beginning to lose it, <laughs> becoming more forgetful. <laughs> so that can't be me either. <laughs> and when when I was younger, I was studying engineering. Now I, I can't even add, can't even add up five and five. You know, <laughs> forget all that mathematics. I got to use a computer now. <laughs> so that's not me either. So, <laughs> what precisely do you identify with as being yourself? And and not, and not just think about it, but if you can co reflect, contemplate at a deeper level, say, is it this? Is it this? Rather than just go into your brain and think, oh, it could be this and it could be that and might be this and might be that and it's logical if it But look at it, you know, is that memory really you? Is that body really you? So I think he was, he was pointing at meditation rather than just the theory of it or, or thinking about it, but reflecting and contemplating about it, the, the nature of anatta. Then you can begin to see it more, you know, see it happening because it is, it is the truth. It is there, most of the reality is beyond yourself, like beyond your control. When you when you want, when you're allowed when you allow yourself to look at it, you see how much is beyond your control. Yeah. I want to go, you know, yeah. some somewhere. Yeah, but I, you know, I'm in a traffic jam. I'm, you know, my my legs aren't working properly, or I haven't got enough energy, or whatever. You know, yeah. but my mind just zoom is already there. You know. But reality is. And, uh, not quite so easy as I think it is. Do you have any other questions? This is the uh, professional group. Eh? People know it already. We're <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> too shy to ask. <coughs> This question of uh, non-self, if there's no self, then where, what is rebirth? What carries on in the rebirth? We say it's consciousness, carry on rebirth, right? But there's no self, no consciousness. Consciousness is not self. So when a person dies, you say immediately something goes on from this life to the next life, pati sandi, right? So what goes on? There's no self, there's no consciousness. 
Yeah, so but it goes they're on still grasping. One. There's still identification and grasping, isn't there? Do you really understand non-self? Is there somebody there still holding on? It's, it's craving and, and, and grasping that goes on, you see? And it's powerful enough to recreate, you know, bring, bring the elements together again and the other uh, forces of body and mind pull it together again. Those are just the, you know, the, the, the five, yeah, five khandas, you know, five groups of grasping, body, feeling, or perception or, or memory, uh, thinking processes and consciousness. They're just factors of, body, of, of the body and mind, you see. But this grasping of it makes a person, makes an identity, makes what we call a self. So uh, the arahant, so an enlightened person, has no more grasping. So these five groups, when, the, when the, the body comes to its end, there's no basis anymore for it. It doesn't keep going again. But the, but the average person who's not enlightened, they still have that grasping part. You know, like Just like the fear of death comes up. You know, I don't want to go. You know? So that's what gets, that power of that keeps going, you see. So it's, it's not a, a thing, it's a force. You know, somebody gave an example that I think was quite useful. You know, the, in, in the Buddhist teaching, talk about rebirth, not reincarnation. See, reincarnation means something is incarnate again and again. It's reincarnate, you see. That's like having a, a marble and putting in one glass, and that glass breaks, and you put it in the next glass. So mar the marble goes on, you see. That's the soul. But in, in the Buddhist, te the Theravada teaching, it's like, you have the different candles. You light one candle, and it's burning, it's burning, and then that goes down. You light the next candle. There's no thing that goes on. Yeah. There is a, there's the fire, the force, this energy of fire keeps burning, keeps burning, as long as there's fuel there. Yeah. And the fuel is craving, the Buddha said. So if you think more in terms of, of energies and forces, you might be a little bit more clear about it than the thing. So you say, who's reborn? No, no, this isn't a who, it's a what's reborn. Craving, grasping is reborn. It's what? Process. Processes. But can you see processes? Can you see the wind? Yeah. There's air here. Can you see the, uh, can you see the air? <laughs> but you, know, you, can't, you can't grab the wind, can you? The wind is the movement of the air. See? You have to look at this this movement process. You can't you can't hold it, but it's there. Huh? You can feel wind. You can feel it. You can see the effects of it, but you can't grab it. <clears throat> Hi, uh, thank you, Ajahn, for the talk. Um, so I was wondering if you feel disagreement with somebody's perception or I think at some point we need to take a stand on certain things like having that sense of social justice. Some things are just right, some things are just wrong. So how do you reconcile with not having the, the self, the sense of self, and how do you um, yeah, well, yeah, reconcile that? Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, non-self is a, for the Buddha, he, it's not a fixed position, it's a reflection. The Buddha never said there was no self. Never said there was no self, but he, he trying to point away to, to the wider picture. Okay? There is, I would say there's a sense of a self, but what is that self? Yeah. What is it really? That you, have, that you have a sense of. Sometimes you sense the body, and, you, and if you aren't careful, you start, you start identifying with it. But it but it begins to change, and then oh, yeah, right. If you look more close, closely, more clearly, I see it as some changing process here. His body is just chemical processes going on. What, what is the self? Yeah. You have this four-letter word, you know, which seems to be a noun, but it's actually a verb. You're selfing. You're just selfing for a while, you see? Selfing for a lifetime. <laughs> so in, in my book, I try to put, in, in, put these, these words into verbs, and they come out a bit funny sometimes, you know? But one of the words the Buddha used, it was, it's called eye-making. 
ahankara, you know, eye making. You're, you're making up the eye as you go along, you see. And that, that, I think that more clearly expresses the Buddhist teachings about <coughs> this being made up. So, you know, there, there is a, a making of this eye, so there is a, a sense of an eye, but it's being made up all the time, continuously. So, I mean, to get back to, you know, the other, you mentioned about social justice, for example. I mean, there is, there is, you can say there is, you can say, um, skillful and unskillful. There's good and bad, if you like. I mean, I don't like to use those words because sometimes people have a definition of what's good and bad, you see. But what the Buddha talked about was kusala and akusala, skillful and unskillful. So certain things like social justice, it is a skillful condition for peaceful society. If there's if it's injustice, then it's going to lead eventually to conflict and wars and disharmony and not a very you know, healthy state of, of uh, society for, for uh, prosperity, for your own health, for um, spiritual teachings. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you had the opportunity, you try to, you know, try to emphasize the skillful ways of living, the skillful speech, the skillful attitudes, the skillful, uh, you know, social uh, um, conditions or approaches. So, I mean, so like you say, there, there is, but, you know, it, it's uh, helpful, you know, to look at skillful in the wider sense, too. Because there are some people who, so maybe they have these political opinions, and they, they, they try and change it violently. They end up creating more disharmony than, you know, I'm, you know, I'm campaigning, I'm, I'm going to blow this place up for social justice. Uh, is that justice? <laughs> if you're going to hurt somebody else, is that really, really justice in the bigger sense? So you, you have a one very narrow perception of social justice. But if you don't see it in the wider sense, it's not really justice. And the Buddha talked about you have to look at uh, what, what's beneficial for yourself, for others, and both together you know, to get the whole picture. So, you know, just following your own perception of social justice is not getting the whole picture. So when, when you tune it in with Dhamma, then, okay, take in the bigger picture. And that's more in harmony with the truth. So it takes and in, includes more people and, it, and the more, more of the way things really are, not just your perspective, narrow perspective on it. Sorry, it was a long, yeah, it was a long answer. <laughs> but nobody else will ask a question. So <laughs> or <laughs> Did I answer your question? Did I? <laughs> in several ways. <laughs> Anybody else? <clears throat> Lumpur, uh, thank you for the talk. I'm just wondering whether you can please elaborate more on Dharma centeredness. How do you mean? And um, how does that differ from self-centeredness in a, in a conventional self sense? Conventional sense. Yes. <coughs> I mean, all of, because everything that we see is dhamma, mm -hmm. including the self. So I'm just trying to figure out how how to reconcile that. Well, it's it's a matter of emphasis mainly, I would say. Mm -hmm. People who don't understand the principle of Dhamma, they're, they're, they're put all their energy into self. You know, this, there's themselves as the most important thing in the world, and you know, and they have no, they have no, uh, uh, they have no comprehension that there's another way to relate, which is more in tune with the bigger picture. I mean, we, I think, I think we understand, we understand it in English anyway. We say somebody's very egocentric. They're very insensitive to other people. And they just think of themselves all the time. They're, they're very, uh, they're very, you know, ego-centered all the time. It's not a very skillful thing, even even for not only religions, but I mean, even in uh, uh, secular society, somebody's very self-centered all the time. You know, it's uh, they're they're trying to manipulate the environment to suit themselves all the time. You know, and they, you know they throw in their garbage around and say, well, it's easy for me. I just you know, get rid of this garbage, you know. But 
it's affecting other people who have to look at that garbage. <laughs> so the, the Dhamma is you know, the, Buddhist, the Buddhist phrase, word for the bigger picture, the way things really are. It's, it's the complete picture of things. But in some ways, isn't a view, any view, um, still a view for myself? Yeah, to, to, yep, yep. To, any, to, to varying degrees, you see. Yes. Yeah. So how do you break out from that? Well, you yeah. have, if you have a right view, we're talking about right view in the Eightfold Path, that's taking into, into account the bigger picture. I mean, one of the first things about right view, the first, uh, first aspects of it, is understanding the law of cause and effect. That uh, you know your your actions have wider compl implications, and so you're more careful then about how you uh, exhibit yourself, how you express yourself. You know, in, in a more skillful way, ideally. See. But isn't that still a from a certain consciousness? Sure, sure. I mean, are you an hour hunt yet? No, yeah, trying well, to be. So <laughs> we, we all, until you're an hour hunt, you still have self-centeredness to some degree. You see. But, but the book we're pointing at how to try and move beyond that. How, uh, how do we move beyond if we don't know how to move beyond that? Well, I, I, generosity, generosity, okay. yeah. <laughs> I'm staying at what? Palalai, Palalai. <laughs> so, yeah, so come there in the morning and offer breakfast. <laughs> or your, yourself, you know, just look, look at the, how, you, how you hold the precepts, for example. You know, and, and if you... You know, you, you notice, oh, I don't like, just look at the five precepts and you think, well, which one don't I like? You know? <laughs> now, look, who, who's the I that doesn't like it? And why, why don't you like it? You know, wh what part of you doesn't like it? So what part of you is, is in, in conflict with that then? Mm -hmm. I mean, those five precepts, they're, you know, in, in a Buddhist sense anyway, they're held to be kind of general principles of social harmony. And uh, except maybe the fourth, the fifth one, huh? it's hard to talk about that in France. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not drinking, you know, alcohol. You know, say, well, just a little drink. Yeah, very healthy, you know. Red red wine's very healthy. <laughs> but if, but I I noticed, for example, this was a somebody came to the monastery and they were <clears throat> they wanted to you know, as part of the they were. They were, they were from a Buddhist culture anyway. So they, they automatically say, well, I want to take the five precepts. Yeah. And then uh, when they're taking the precepts and the one which they didn't like, they just stopped. They didn't, didn't <laughs> they were silent. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, want, they just, they went through the custom of take, asking for the five precepts, you know. And then when it came to the, I think it was the third one, maybe. <laughs> the person just kept quiet. Why is that? You know? <laughs> so they obviously it was just a ceremony they're going through, see, and I obviously then I was even reluctant to give it to them, you know. So but now I say to some people, you know, it's it's better to te keep at least three of them than nothing, you know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so and, and and meditation, just like I was saying, you know, there's these three ways of practice, generosity, morality, meditation can be very helpful. So if you had that experience, for example, a little bit of calmness, you notice there's not a very, there's, there's a, a less, um, less pronounced self-centeredness in that. There's more space in your mind, less reactiveness, you know, less self-expression popping up. You know, for many people, the, the self is, as soon as they see something, Immediately the mind, oh, I like that, I don't like that, this is good. Yeah, the self is right there all the time. But when your mind has built some concentration on the breathing, for example, that, that, that self-promotion and that self-emphasis falls to the background. And there can just be seeing and silence. Hearing, silence. You know, there's not a personal comment. Oh, that's a nice sound, I like that sound. Where can I get that sound? There's just this hearing and the story. And in the hearing, there's no, there's no sense of a self there, predominating, you see. That's what, that's what the Dhamma is, just sound, just sight, smell, taste, touch, thought. 
but nobody having to add a story to it and possess it and like it and dislike it and all that. And very, very, bit, bit of a different experience. You know? And it's closer to the truth. I mean, it is the truth. There is sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thought. Okay? And it's going on whether you like it or not, or you want it or not. It just goes on. You know? It's just nature. So that's the Dhamma part of it. And it's very peaceful. Until you, until you experience it, maybe you don't recognize that. You know, if your self is very prominent, you, you, you think, well, I, 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 you know, my self is so prominent, you know, so important, I've got to be present all the time. <laughs> but I tell you, it's a real headache. Well, at least mine is anyway. My self is really a headache most of the time. Better, I, I prefer to not, not have it, not, not deal with it. Just put it to sleep. <laughs> take a rest, take a break. You know? Like one of my first experiences in Sri Lanka, the first retreat I was on, I'd just been traveling for a year and a half in Europe and then across Asia. And then I... I went to this meditation monastery and little gave me a little room, you know, six feet by four feet. You know, after I've been traveling half the world, here I'm sitting in this little cell in Sri Lanka trying to watch my breath. You know, how boring! <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I can go to the beach in Greece somewhere. And I can be yeah. <laughs> here. I'm sitting in this little cell, you know, watching the breath. And so the mind was just going on and on, going through all these stories and all these countries. And then one day I just got so tired. I said, "Ah, oh, shut up." And it did. The mind just shut up. And I thought, oh, oh I'm, f I'm so lonely. I start thinking again. <laughs> but then afterwards I realized it was so peaceful. And my mind just shut up. And I wasn't dead. Yeah. <laughs> it was, in fact, I was even more alive than before. You know, when your mind is busy, you're so distracted, you don't even realize that you're present. That you're in the present moment. But when the mind goes quiet, the present moment becomes really alive. It's the only reality is the present moment. And, but most of the time our mind is hardly ever in the, in the present moment. Huh? Going over the past and planning the future. and So you know, you're not alive, basically. You're in the past or future. Yeah? But when your mind comes to the present moment, that's when you're alive. Well, you, you, are you believing me or does it sound familiar to you? <laughs> Does it sound familiar? It's your experience? Ah, okay. <laughs> then you won't forget it if it's your experience. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ajahn. Uh, elaborating that, I think, you know, uh, very interesting for me to uh, understand the uh, Dharma Center. Uh, Dharma Center, I thought that you were trying to explain was something like harmony, harmony with uh, the rest of the world, whatever you see or whatever you hear, harmonize yourself with the rest, with generosity. And that you will achieve the calmness that you're talking about. So should I say, finally, what you want to really practice is harmony with the world, with the rest of the world. Are you trying to say that? Um, maybe you could, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if you're trying to harmonize, there's still you there. I'm trying to harmonize with my world. <laughs> so, but if you, if you can just receive what is happening, see, just, there's, there's a receptiveness there without making a big effort to try and be receptive. I mean, you can, you can make some, you know, shift some energy in that direction that you can be more receptive to the way things really are, despite your own preferences. And whether I like it or not, that's the way it is. And this, this, this allows an attunement, attunement with the Dhamma, with reality, with the way things really are. And most of the time, I mean, the average person probably is just slightly out of tune with the way things really are. But the more you emphasize your self-centeredness, you know, the world doesn't always live up to your expectations. Things don't always happen the way I would like them to happen. See? So, but, okay, that's the way it is, though, for now. And if I, if I can do something about it, maybe add my own energy to it, add a, add a, 
a, some kind of a, a skillful response to it, perhaps get realigned to some degree. But other times, you can't, you can't do an awful lot. So you just be patient. Be patient and equanimous with it. Good evening, Rong Paul. Um, I'd like to ask a more mundane question. Um, the question is, I realize one of the biggest challenge is uh, living with um, ego, very, very egocentric people. So um, I realize that I'm not very good at that. And I've been trying to put the Dharma practice into this, like um, watching my own reactions, um, not looking outside, but looking inside all the time. Um, and there were times when I just had to, you know, give way and just retreat and retreat and retreat until I'm right at the corner. So I'm just wondering if you can advise that if we have to deal with very egocentric people. Um, I mean, as a Dharma practitioner, what is the what is, the, what is the best way to practice where it's a balance for for others as well as for our, ourselves, you know, our inner balance? Mm. It probably you. depends upon the, you know, the individual and the situation, quite situational too. I mean, you, you just say, you know, egocentric people, but there's different degrees of it, you know, and, and at different times too, maybe. You know, when people get under stress, they, they become more more defensive and more egocentric and you know but it's not their natural you know temperament or personality all the time it's only under certain situations but i mean one one help one i guess the first the first stage is that we need to try and maintain our own integrity and maintain our between our own center and if we get pulled into it into their stories and their situations then we really not much used to ourselves or other people either so you need to ta maintain some centeredness within yourself is better, is more healthy. But you also need to be somewhat receptive to others. I mean, one, uh, one, one particular uh, emphasis when it's maybe not so egocentric people who aren't really taking, sucking your energy away, is to try and keep it 30% with them, 33%, 33% with you, and 33% the exchange. That, that harmonize with what the Buddha says about the skillful, you know, skillful for you, skillful for them, and skillful for together, you know, both of us together. So, I mean, if, if these people are, if it's a really, you know, like a really uh, egocentric person, who are very, very demanding and t takes a lot of your energy away, then maybe you have to 50% to yourself, or <laughs> 80%. <laughs> So you have to kind of look at the situation, you see. But if you want to probably want to keep your job, don't cut them off completely. Yeah? <laughs> um, and may I also ask another um, like experience? Like uh, it only happened very recently. I had to tell somebody who was pushing me, and this was a, a total stranger. So I was I remembered very, being very calm. And this person started to get very agitated. Um, mm -hmm. And no matter what I said, like I said, uh, okay, I'll just cut the long story short, but no matter what I said, the person just kept raising their voice until it was like shouting, you know. Mm -hmm. So I said, um, you're raising your voice and you're shouting. And the person was at the top of the voice and shouting and saying, no, uh, he, he isn't. So. In the end, I just felt like, okay, this is not going anywhere. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to sort of get away, but the person didn't want to let me go. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, okay, but what I watched was like my internal uh, response. Like I could feel like the, the racing of the, the heart and like there was probably some fear in terms of like the feelings of being intimidated. And... Um, I must admit, I didn't like that. So I had that heart racing and I was like um, really 
trying to keep very calm, but yet internally you can see this, um, shall I say, the physiological response. So at the end of it, the, the, the last statement was the person uh, kind of shouted loudly and said, I'm mad. Then I, I was like responding and say, look who is more mad here. <laughs> so, but I'm not sure if I could have done better. I mean, what should I do as a Dharma practitioner to be better in this kind of situation? Well, again, it's, it's very situational. We just have to respond from where we're at, you know, at the time. Yeah. But if, if, if people are somewhat sensitive, they just get more defensive. See, like that person, no, no, I'm not angry, I'm not angry. You know? yeah, I mean, it, it obviously shows that they're, they're really, you know, they're really uh, unconscious or they're <laughs> really unaware. So. There's not much you could do for them. You just have compassion for them. You know, just recognize you, all you can do is have compassion. You're not going to resolve this anyway. And threatening them is even going to escalate. So you just try to uh, step out of it. You just kind of remove your energy from the situation and close your eyes or whatever. And just. Yeah. But they, they may react to that too, that you're ignoring them or something other. So I mean, you're, <laughs> So it's very situational. So, so <laughs> but if you have a few cards up your sleeve, maybe you try a few things and <laughs> see what works. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Ajahn. So um, my question is, as we contemplate uh, moving from the self-centeredness to dharma-centeredness, and it involves relinquishing, right? then to what extent do we, in a sense, the self, take a deliberate attempt to relinquish, you know, like for instance, throw on a backpack and move to the forest, mm -hmm. right? So that would be a deliberate attempt to relinquish, yeah. you know, versus just chilling out in Singapore and coming here on a weekly basis mm -hmm. and just going with the flow, right? Mm -hmm. So, so in, in the first case, we are deliberately relinquishing yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure to what extent, you know, on this spectrum, if you could guide, yeah. Well, the, the main thing is about relinquishment, it's, it's not holding on, you see. So not even holding on to relinquishment. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you, you try it out and see if, you know, that, that it kind of you know, re reduces your, your heaviness of heart, uh, reduces your load, uh, clears more space in your life. Yeah. See if it, if it works. But not holding on to okay, you know, you know, I should hear about severe relinquish everything. So you know, go up in the street and take your clothes off and <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it's it's a, it's it's more like stages, you know, trying to lighten the load, you know, less things to hold on to, less things to identify with, you know, and and try it out, you know, and, and there there is, you know, there is the uh, you say a kind of relinquishment which is like a lightness and not making a big, you know, a big religion out of it or a big issue out of it or something too. And see how it goes, you know. And I mean, you, ideally you can live in the middle of a, of a city and be relinquished in your heart, you see. Still, you're just not attached to it, not identified with it. You know, those are the conditions right now that you're living with and so it's, you know, you just use these conditions and things will change and no big shock and you're not going to be regret it and not be resentful about it and you know, it's more a state of mind than, uh, than one of you know, having to do something specifically. Yeah. Otherwise you just shave your head off and <laughs> <laughs> relinquish your hair. And <laughs> but I, I wouldn't say that either. I mean, for some people it's not right, I would, not even useful I would say if they have this too high images, too high ideals. You know, I've, I've, in my 45 years in the monastery, I've seen lots of people come in, you know, with big, high, very high ideals, and not last. Yeah. You know, and the ones who have the highest ideals and the least experience, or least, you know, the least grounded in reality, they stay the shortest time, because the reality doesn't live up to their expectations. And I think, oh, I'll just go to the monastery and leave all my problems behind. But then you bring your mind with you, you know, which, is, which is the biggest problem. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving your computer and your car and your house is a small problem compared to what's in your mind. 
So, <laughs> so I mean, it's, it's you know, we we have to acknowledge we have still a grasping of a self. We're an enlightened thing. So, you, but you can use it in a skillful way to find ways to kind of you can say kind of trick the self into letting go. And if you you know you try something like just put on a backpack and go to the forest and you see whether you know what this does to you. How much are you really attached to your iPhone or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> really. You wouldn't, you wouldn't find out unless you try it. Huh? Yeah. And then you can still come back to it, but you recognize, oh, I've got to be a little more, a little more careful here. Because it, it can learn, it can dominate my life then. And I become a slave to it. Yeah. So many of us are slaves already to these things, and we don't even know it. Yeah. We think, I'm in control. Yeah. But the phone rings and you run to it. <laughs> well, it wasn't what was going to disturb my talk. That was it, yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 that was it. It was the alarm. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So it's a skillful use of it. <laughs> skillful use of it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, thank you very much. Let's thank Lompo with three sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs>